was on the wrong background. All right, I just, I give up. Hi again, everybody. I'm gonna go send my tweet. I'm skipping the start screen just because at this point, I don't know. But, That's not what I wanted. I'm just gonna. S I mentioned that I was gonna send this tweet already. Oh no, that's not what I wanted. That is technically what I wanted, but not really. Shit. You know what? I'm just not gonna worry about that for tonight. I'm just gonna get into... Hello again. I enjoy reading books after all. Thanks, Mortis. I appreciate that. Okay, there is... Okay. So that should be all my chats, except for I need to get Twitter done. I haven't done... I haven't finished Twitter shit yet. Hey, Metastep. How are you doing? <laughs> yes, the only stream I'm doing tonight. <laughs> oh my god. Oh Can you please god. let this lady know that it's fine? They have. They've said it repeatedly. Keep telling her that. She still won't believe you, but keep telling her because holy shit. fine and we enjoyed it i know i know look this is me being a woman this is the most womanly thing you will probably get out of me he can attest to that all right i have posted <coughs> i've announced this stream since this stream's on purpose That is indeed robust. Uh, for the record, those of you who are a member here on the channel, um, tomorrow night we will be doing the member night for YouTube members. That is, uh, we're going to play Among Us. You can actually play that from anything. You can play it from your cell phone. You can play it from your computer. You can play it from your Xbox. I don't know if you can play it on your PlayStation 5, but probably I wouldn't be surprised. Um, hey, you're wrong. How are you tonight? I am getting my keyboard set up to charge for a little bit while we read. He is. He is, in fact, the robust delirium. <sighs> All right. All right. I swear, I'm calming down. I just... That was a very awkward thing for me. I'm an emotionally locked up person, and y'all got to see way more than I ever anticipated.
Nice! What are you doing with it? You should be a dirty goblin. Uh, okay. Let me open up... I almost forgot I need to open up Twitter. You're oh, yeah. Yeah, I've done that. Um... I usually order my dirt in yards as opposed to pounds. I wonder how that works out. Though this year I'm not going to be able to do that because they're supposed to come and they're supposed to take like six inches of dirt all the way around my uh, all the way around my house because we live near where a uh, a smelter used to be and they need to clean the dirt. So they take six, six inches of dirt and put in new dirt to get rid of the bad dirt. But because of that, where my garden is, is going to be, um, is going to be unavailable. So I'm going to have to garden in movable planters this year, as opposed to my very lovely garden that I normally have. But yeah, it is what it is. Alrighty. You could have just asked. I haven't started reading. Well, it's a scam. It would be. Well, I mean, you could say it's a scam because the government's paying for it. I don't have to pay for it, but the government's paying for it. So. I'm sure that someone in their infinite wisdom out there convinced the government it was a great idea. So, that's like, what the fuck ever, guys. Metastep, you weren't here earlier. I will allow everybody else in chat to inform you how I'm doing. <laughs> I'm still recovering. <laughs> Oh my god. I've never played Goose Goose Duck. It sounds interesting. <clears throat> Hold on, I got I can't type. Cause I put my keyboard over here. No, uh, Metastep, I, I accidentally went live earlier. While recording a video. actually played Untitled Goose either. <coughs> but yeah, we'll be we'll be doing Among Us tomorrow night for uh for channel members. It's only two dollars a month. Just saying, and you get to watch that, uh, that lovely stream I just did on accident. That is now a member-exclusive property. Ah, <sighs> alright guys, we're gonna go ahead and get into the reading. We're probably gonna do a couple stories tonight, I would say least two because the ones currently are pretty short
Oh, uh, tomorrow night we start at 6 p.m. Mountain, so that's uh, 8 p.m. Eastern and uh, 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Pacific. Yeah, I think we'll end up doing about two stories tonight because it's Man of Stone and... the horror in the museum. They're not long, long, but they're not short, short either. <laughs> 99 story dark one. <laughs> I will read you your bedtime story, my friend. <laughs> Alright. Let me take another drink of water. All right, tonight we're watching, or watching, the reading, we're reading. The Man of Stone, with which he, with, with Hazel healed. Ben Hayden was always a stubborn chap, and once he had heard about those strange statues in the upper Adirondacks, nothing could keep him from going to see them. I had just been his closest acquaintance for year, or I had been his close closest acquaintance for years and our Damon and Pythias friendship made us inseparable at all times so when Ben firmly decided to go well I had to trot along too like a faithful collie Jack why does this seem familiar Oh, no, we already read this one. Shit. I must have skipped ahead and read this one. So we're gonna... Oh, crap. So we're gonna do horror in the museum instead. Did we skip ahead and read this one, or is this one in here twice? Hold on, let me check. Um, let me see here. We did Call of Cthulhu, Color of Space, uh, Yig. We must have skipped forward and done that one. I wish I'd noted that. That's fine. So, we've got horror in the museum, and then... what? How long is this next one? Thing on the doorstep. Shouldn't be very long, I don't think. All right. All right, we are going to uh, reposition because I have, in fact, read that other one. I can't believe I forgot. Uh, and we're going to do the horror in the museum, which is also with Hazel healed. And then the thing on the doorstep. I think. Probably. I think we can get through them both. All right. Let's try that again. We're going to start all over again. Thank you for bearing with me. It was languid curiosity which first brought Stephen Jones to Rogers Museum. Someone had told him about the queer underground place in Southwark Street across the river where wax and things so much more horrible than the worst effigies at Madame Tussauds were shown, and he had strolled in one, day, one April day to see how disappointing he would find it. Oddly, he was not disappointed. There was something different and distinctive here, after all. Of course, the usual gory commonplaces were present. Landru, Dr. Crippen, Madame de Mears, Rizzio, Lady Jane Grey, endless maimed victims of war and revolution, and monsters like Giles de Rice, Marquis de Sade. But there were other things which made which had made him breathe faster and stay till the ringing of the closing bell. The man, who had the man who had fashioned this collection could be no ordinary Montebank. There was imagination, 
even a kind of diseased genius in some of the stuff. Later, he learned about George Rogers. The man had been on the Tussaud, Tussaud staff, Tussaud? Tussaud, staff, but some troubles had developed which led him to his discharge, which had led to his discharge. There were aspirations, uh, uh, hmm, aspersions on his sanity and tales of his crazy forms of secret worship. Though latterly, his success with his own basement museum had dulled the edge of some criticisms while sharpening the insidious points of others. Teratology and the iconography of nightmare were his hobbies, and even he had the prudence to screen off some of his worst effigies in a special al alcove for adults only. It was this alcove which had fascinated Jones so much. There were lumpish hybrid things which only fantasy could spawn, molded with devilish skulls and colored in a horribly lifelike fashion. Some were the figures of well-known myth, gorgons, chimeras, dragons, cyclops, and all their shuddersome congreners. Others were drawn from darker and more furtive whispered cycles of subterranean legend. Black Formus Sogoa, Many Tentacle Tuthulu, Pro Basidian Chognorfogn, and other rumored blasphemies from the forbidden from forbidden books like the Necronomicon, the Book of Ebon, or the an Osprachilchen Kulten of von Juncht. But the worst were wholly original with Rogers and represented shapes which no tale of antiquity had ever dared to suggest. Several were hideous parodies on forms of organic life we know, while others seemed taken from feverish dreams of other planets and other galaxies. The wilder paintings of Clark Ashton Smith might suggest a few, but nothing could suggest the eff effect of poignant, loathsome terror created by their great size and fiendishly cutting workmanship, and by the diabolically clever lighting conditions under which they were exhibited. Stephen Jones, as a leisurely connoisseur of the bazaar and art, had sought out Rogers himself in the dingy office and workroom behind the vaulted museum chamber. An evil-looking crypt lit lighted dimly by dusty windows set in slit-like and horizontal, set slit-like and horizontal in the back brick wall, on a level on a level with the ancient cobblestones of a hidden courtyard. It was here that the images were repaired. Here too, where some of them had been made, waxen arms, legs, heads, and torsos lay in grotesque array on the various benches, while on high tiers of shelves, matted wigs, ravenous-looking teeth, and glossy, staring eyes were indiscriminately scattered. Costumes of all sorts hung from hooks, and in one alcove were, a great, pi were great piles of flesh-colored waxen cakes, and shelves filled with paint cans and brushes of every description. In the center of the room was a large melting furnace used to prepare the wax for molding, its firebox topped by a huge iron container on hinges with a spout which permitted the pouring of melted wax with the merest touch of a finger. Hey, drama! Other things in the dismal crypt were less describable. Isolated parts of problem problematical sorry, problematical enemy entities whose assembled forms were the phantoms of delirium. At one end was a heavy planked, a heavy plank fastened by unusually large pad padlock and with a very peculiar symbol painted over it. Jones, who had once access to the dreaded Necronomicon, shivered involuntarily as he recognized that symbol. The showman, he reflected, must indeed be a person of disconcertingly wide scholarship in dark and dubious fields. Hey, thanks for the sub, Warren. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, my dog's whimpering and it made me lose my place. Ah, oh, there we go. Nor did the conversation of Rogers disappoint him. The man was tall, lean, and rather unkempt, with large black eyes which gazed combustively from a pallid and usually stubble-covered face. He did not resent Jones's intrusion, but seemed to welcome the chance of unburdening himself to an interested person. His voice was of singular depth and resonance, and harbored a sort of rep repressed intensity bordering on the feverish. Hey, thanks for the follow, Jimmy Thin on Earth. I appreciate that. Dogs are funny. <laughs> Hopefully this, the, the sound of this book isn't uh, <laughs> disrupted by <laughs> a dog squeaking a toy. Uh, funny dogs. Hmm. His voice was of singular depth and resonance and harbored a sort of repressed intensity bordering on the feverish. Jones did not wonder that many had thought him mad. With every successive call, and such calls became a habit as the weeks went by, Jones had found Rogers more communicative and confidential. From the first, there had been hints of strange faiths and practices on the showman's part and later these hints expanded into tales, despite a few odd corroborative fo photographs, whose extravagance was almost comic. <laughs> it was sometime in June, on a night when Jones had brought a bottle of good whiskey and plied his host somewhat freely, that the really demented talk first appeared. Before that, there had been a there had been wild enough stories, accounts of mysterious trips to Tibet, an African, the African interior, the Arabian desert, the Amazon Valley, Alaska, and certain little known island, islands of the South Pacific, plus claims of having read such monstrous and has fabulous books as the prehistoric Nakotic fragments and the dull chants attributed to malign and non-human Ling. But nothing in all this had been so unmistakably insane as what had cropped out that June evening under the spell of whiskey. To be plain, Rogers began making vague boasts of having found certain things in nature that no one had found before, and of having brought back tangible evidences of such discoveries. According to his bibulous harangue, he had gone farther than anyone else in interpreting the obscure, your, bleh, obscure and primal books he studied, and had been directed by them to certain remote places where strange survivals are hidden, survivals of aeons, and life cycles earlier than mankind. and in some cases connected with other dimensions and other worlds, communications which was frequent in the forgotten pre-human days. Jones marveled at the fancy which could conjure up such notions and wondered just what Roger's mental history had been. Had his work amidst the morbid grotesqueries of Madame Tussauds been the start of his imaginative flights, or was the tendency innate so that his choice of occupation was merely one of its manifestations? At any rate, the man's work had been very, clo very closely linked with his notions. Even now, there was no mistaking the trend of his blackest hints about the nightmarish monstrosities in the screened-off adults-only alcove. Heedless of ridicule, rid ridicule, he was trying to imply that not all of these demonic abnormalities were artificial. It was Jones' frank skepticism and amusement at these irresponsible claims which broke up the growing cord cordiality. Rogers, it was clear, took himself very seriously, 
for ne he now became morose and resentful, continuing to tolerate Jones, only through a dogged urge to break down the, his wall of urbane and complacent incredulity. Wild tales and suggestions of rites and sacrifices to nameless elder gods continued, and now and then Rogers would lead his guests to one of the hideous blasphemies in the screened-off alcove and point out different features different, difficult to reconcile with even the finest human craftsmanship. Jones continued his visits through sheer fascination, though he knew he had forfeited his host's regard. At times, he would try to humor Rogers with, pretend, with pretended assent to some mad hint or assertion, but the gaunt showman was seldom to be deceived by such tactics. The tension came to a head later in September. Jones had casually dropped into the museum one afternoon and was wandering around the dim corridors whose horrors were now so familiar, when he heard a very peculiar sound from the general direction of Roger's workroom. Others heard it too, and stared, started nervously as the echoes reverberated through the great vaulted basement. The three attendants exchanged odd glances, one of them, a dark, taciturn, foreign-looking fellow who always served Rogers as a repairer and assistant designer, smiled in a way which seemed to puzzle his colleagues, and which also grated very harshly on some facet of Joan's sensibilities. It was the yelp or scream of a dog, and was such a sound as could be made only under conditions of the utmost fright and agony combined. Its stark, anguishly anguished frenzy was appalling to hear and in this setting of grotesque abnormality it held double hideousness jones remembered that no dogs were allowed in the museum he was about to go to the door leading to the workroom when the dark attendant stopped him with a word and a gesture mr rogers the man said in a soft somewhat accented voice at once apologetic and vaguely sardonic was out and there were standing orders to admit no one to the workroom during his absence as for that yelp, it was undoubtedly something out in the courtyard behind the museum. This neighborhood was full of stray mongrels, and their fights were sometimes shockingly noisy. There were no dogs in any part of the museum. But if Mr. Jones wished to see Mr. Rogers, he might find him just before closing time. After this, Jones climbed up the old stone steps to the street outside and examined the squalid neighborhood curiously. The leaning, decrepit buildings, once dwellings but were now largely shops and warehouses, were very ancient indeed. Some of them were of a gabled type, seeming to go back to the Tudor times, and a faint miasmic stench hung subtly over the whole region. Behind the dingy house whose basement held the museum was a low archway pierced by a cobbled alley, and this Jones entered in a vague fashion Oh, in a vague wish to find the courtyard behind the workroom and settle the affair of the dog more comfortably in his mind. The courtyard was dim in the late afternoon light, hemmed in by rear walls even uglier and more intangibly menacing than the crebbling street facades of the old evil houses. Not a dog was in sight, and Jones wondered how the aftermath of such a frantic turmoil could have completely vanished so soon. Despite the assistant's statement that no dog had been in the museum, Jones glanced nervously at the three small windows of the basement workroom, narrow, horizontal rectangles close to the grass-grown pavement, with grimy panes that stared repulsively and incuriously like the eyes of dead fish. To their left, a worn flight of steps led to an opaque and heavily bolted door. Some impulse urged him to crouch low on the damp, broken cobblestones and peer in, on the chance that the thick green shades, worked by long cords that hung down to a reachable level, might not be drawn. The outer surfaces were thick with dirt, but as he rubbed them with his handkerchief, he saw there was no obscuring con curtain in the way of his vision. So shadowed was the, first, was the cellar from the inside that not much could be made out but the grotesque working paraphernalia now and then loomed up spectrally as Jones tried each of the windows in turn. It seemed evident at first that no one was within, yet when he peered through the extreme right-hand window, the one nearest the entrance alley, 
he saw a glow of light at the farther end of the apartment, which made him pause in bewilderment. There was no reason why any light should be there. It was an inner side of the room, and he could not recall any gas or electric fixture near that point. Another look defined the glow as a large, vertical rectangle, and a thought occurred to him. It was in that direction that he had always noticed the heavy plank door with the abnormally large padlock. The door which was never opened, and above which was crudely smeared that hideous cryptic symbol from the fragmentary records of forbidden elder magic. It must be open now, and there was a light inside. All his former speculations as to where that door led, and as to what lay behind it, were now renewed with terrible disquieting force. Jones wandered aimlessly around the dismal locality till close to six o'clock, when he returned to the museum to make the call on Rogers. He could hardly tell why he wished so especially to see the man just then, but there must have been some subconscious misgivings about that terribly unplaceable canine scream of the afternoon, and about the glow of light in that disturbing and, unusual, and usually unopened inner doorway with the heavy padlock. The attendants were leaving as he arrived, and he thought he saw that Orabona, the dark, foreign-looking assistant, eyed him with something like sly, repressed amusement. He did not relish that look, even though he had seen the fellow turn it on his employer many times. The vaulted exhibition room was ghoulish in its desertion, but he strode quickly through it and rapped on the door of the office and workroom. Response was slow in coming, though there were footsteps inside. Finally, in response to a second knock, the lock rattled, and the ancient six-paneled portal creaked reluctantly open to reveal the slouching, feverish-eyed form of George Rogers. From the first, it was clear that the showman was in an unusual mood. There was a curious mixture of reluctance and actual gloating in his welcome, and his talk at once veered into extravagance of the most hideous and incredible sort. Surviving elder gods, nameless sacrifices, the other than artificial nature of some of the alcove horrors, all of the usual boasts, but uttered in a tone peculiarly increasing confidence. Obviously, Jones reflected, the poor fellow's madness was gaining on him. From time to time, Rogers would send furtive glances towards the heavy padlocked inner door at the end of the room, or toward a piece of coarse burlap on the floor not far from it, beneath which some small object appeared to be lying. Jones grew more nervous as the moments passed, and began to feel as hesitant about mentioning the afternoon's oddities as he had formerly been anxious to do so. Roger's supposedly resonant bass, bass, sorry, resonant bass almost cracked under the excitement of his fevered ramblings. Do you remember, he shouted, when I told you about the ruined city in Indonesia, in Indochina, where the Chochos lived? You have to admit, I'd been there when you saw the photographs, even if you did think I made that oblong swimmer in the darkness out of wax, if you'd seen it in, if you'd seen it writhing in the underground pools as I did. Well, this is bigger still. I never told you about this, because I wanted to work out the later parts before making any claim. When you see the snapshots, you'll know the geography couldn't have been faked, and I fancy I have another way of proving that it isn't any wax conco concoction of mine. You've never seen it, for the experiments wouldn't let me keep it on exhi exhibition. The showman glanced queerly at the padlock padlocked door. It all comes from that long ritual in the eighth narcotic fragment. When I got it figured out, I saw it, it could have only one meaning. There were things in the north before the land of Lomar, before mankind existed, and this was one of them. It took us all the way up to Alaska and up the no attack from Fort Morton. But the thing was there as we knew it would be. Great Cyclopean ruins, acres of them. There was left left than we less left than we had hoped for. But after three million years, what could one expect? We weren't 
the Esquimaux legends after, uh, and weren't the Esquimaux legends all in the right direction? We couldn't get one of the beggars to go with us and had to sled all the way back to Nome for Americans. Orabona was no good up in that climate. It made him sullen and hateful. I'll tell you later how we found it. When we got the ice blasted out of the pylons of the central ruins and the stairways, and the stairway was just as we knew it would be. The carving's still there, and it had no trouble keeping the Yankees from following us in. Orabona shivered like a leaf. You'd never think it from the damned insolent way he struts out here. He knew enough of the Elder Lord to be properly afraid. The eternal light was gone, but our torches shoot enough. We saw the bones of others who had been before us, eons ago, when the climate was warm. Some of these bones were of things you couldn't even imagine. At the level, at the third level down, we found the ivory throne the fragment said so much about. I may as well tell you it wasn't empty. The thing on that throne didn't move, and we knew then that it needed to get the nourishment of sacrifice, but we didn't want to take it then. Better to get it to London first, or Abona and I went to the surface for the big box, but when we had packed it, we couldn't get it up the three flights of stairs. These steps weren't made for human beings, and their size bothered us. Anyway, it was devilishly heavy, and we had to have the Americans down to get it out. They weren't anxious to go into the place, but of course the worst thing was safely inside the box. We told them it was a batch of ivory carvings, archaeological stuff, and after seeing the carved throne, they probably believed us. It's a wonder they didn't suspect hidden treasures and demand a share. They must have told queer tales around Nome later on, though I doubt if they ever went back to those ruins, even for the ivory throne. Rogers paused and felt around in his desk and produced an envelope of good side photographic prints. Extracting one and laying it face down before him, he handed the rest to Jones. The set was certainly an odd one. Ice-clad hills, dog sleds, men in furs and vast tumbled ruins against the background of snow. Ruins whose bizarre outlines and enormous stone blocks could hardly be accounted for. One flashlight view shooed an incredible interior chamber with wild carvings and a curious throne whose proportions could not have been designed for a human occupant. The carvings on the gigantic masonry, high walls, and peculiarly vaulted, vaulting high ahead were mainly symbolic and involved both wholly unknown designs and certain hieroglyphics darkly cited in obscene legends. Over the throne loomed the same dreadful symbol which was now painted on the workroom wall above the padlocked paint plank door. Jones started a nervous glance at the closed portal. Assuredly, Rogers had been to strange places and had seen strange things, yet this mad interior picture might easily be a fraud, taken from a very clever stage setting. One must not be too credulous, but Rogers was continuing. Well, we shipped the box from Nome and got to London without any trouble. That was the first time we'd ever brought anything back that had a chance of coming alive. I didn't put it on display because there was more important things to do for it. It needed the nourishment of sacrifice, for it was a god. Of course, I couldn't get it the sort of sacrifice which it used to have in its day, for such things don't exist now. But there were other things which might do. The blood is the life, you know. Even the lemurs and elementals that are older than the earth will come when blood of men or beasts is offered under the right conditions. The expression on the narrator's face had grown very alarming and repulsive so that Jones fidgeted involuntarily in his chair. Rogers seemed to notice his guest's nervousness and continued with a distinctly evil smile. It was last year that I got it. And ever since, I've been trying rites and sacrifices. Orabona hasn't been much help, for he was always against the idea of waking it. He hates it, probably because he's afraid of what it will come to mean. He carries a pistol at all times to protect himself. 
pool, as if there were human protection against it. If I ever see him draw that pistol, I'll strangle him. He wanted me to kill it and make an effigy of it. But I've stuck by my plans, and I'm coming out on top in spite of all the cowards like Orabona and the damned sniggering skeptics like you, Jones. I've chanted the rites and made certain sacrifices, and last week, the transition came. The sacrifice was received and enjoyed. Rogers actually licked his lips, while Jones held himself uneasily rigid. The showman paused and rose, crossing the room to the piece of burlap at which he had glanced so often. Bending down, he took a hold of one of the cor uh, took a hold of the one corner as he spoke again. You've laughed enough at my work. Now it's time for you to get some facts. Orabona tells me you heard a dog screaming around here this afternoon. Do you know what that meant? Jones started. For all his curiosity, he would have been glad to get out without further light on the point which had so puzzled him. But Rogers was inexorable and began to lift the square of burlap. Beneath it lay a crushed, almost shapeless mass, which Jones was slow to classify. It was a once living thing which had some a which some agency had flattened, sucked dry of blood, punctured in a thousand places, and wrung into a limp, broken boned heap of grotesqueness. After a moment, Jones realized what it must be. It was what was left of a dog, a dog perhaps of considerable size and whitish color. Its breed was past recognition, for distortion had come in nameless and hideous ways. Most of the hair was burned off by some pungent acid, and the exposed, bloodless skin was riddled by innumerable circular wounds or incisions. The form of torture was necessary to cause such results was past imagining. Electrified with pure loathing, which conquered his mounting disgust, Jones sprang up with a cry. You damned sadist, you madman! You do a thing like this and dare to speak to a decent man? Rogers dropped the burlap with a malignant sneer and faced his oncoming guest. His word held an unnatural calm. Why, you fool, do you think I did this? Let us admit that the results are unbear are unbeautiful from our limited human standpoint. What of it? It is not human and does not pretend to be. The sacrifice is merely to offer. I gave the dog to it. What happened is its work, not mine. I needed It needed the nourishment of the offering, and it took in its own ways. But let me show you what it looked like. As Jones stood hesitating, the speaker returned to his desk and took up the photograph which he laid face down without shooing. Now he extended it with a curious look. Jones took it and glanced at it in an almost mechanical way. After a moment, the visitor's glance became sharper and more observed, absorbed. For the utterly satanic force of the object depicted had an almost hypnotic effect. Certainly Rogers had outdone himself in modeling the eldritch nightmare which the camera had caught. The thing was a work of sheer infernal genius, genius, and Jones wondered how the public would react when it was placed on exhibition. So hideous a thing has no right to exist. Probably the mere contemplation of it, after it was done, had completely unhinged had completed the unhinging of its maker's mind and led him to worship it with brutal sacrifices. Only a stout sanity could resist the insidious suggestion that the blasphemy was, or had been, some morbid and exotic form of actual life. The thing in the picture squatted, or was balanced, on what appeared to be a clever reproduction of the monstrously carved throne in the other curious photograph. To describe it with any ordinary voca vocabulary would be impossible, for nothing even roughly corresponding to it has ever come with the imagination of sane mankind. It represented something meant perhaps to be roughly connected with the vertebrates of this planet, though one could not be too sure of that. Its bulk was cyclopean, for even squatted, it towered to almost twice the height of Orabona, who was shewn beside it, looking sharply one might 
Looking sharply, one might trace its approximation toward the bodily features of the higher vertebrates. There was an almost globular torso, with six long, sinuous limbs terminating in crab-like claws. From the upper end, a subsidiary, a subsidiary globe bulged forward like, forward bubble-like. Its triangular, its triangle of three staring, fishy eyes, its foot-long and evidently flexible proboscis, and a distended lateral system analogous to gills, suggested that it was a head. Most of the body was covered with what at first appeared to be fur, but which on closer examination proved to be a dense growth of dark, slender tentacles or sucking filaments, each chipped with a mouth suggesting the head of an asp. Hey, Patty, thank you so much for the raid. I appreciate that. Uh, for the record, we're reading the horror in the museum, in case anybody's curious. On the head and below, the proboscis. On the head and below the proboscis, the tentacle tended to be longer and thicker, and marked with the spiral stripes, suggesting the traditional serpent locks of Medusa. To say that such a thing could have had an expression seems paradoxical, yet Jones felt that the triangle of bulging fish eyes and that obliquely poised proboscis all bespoke a blend of hate greed and sheer cruelty incomprehensible to mankind because mixed with other emotions not of this world or this solar system into this bestial abnormality he reflected roger must have poured at once all his malignant insanity and all his uncanny sculptural genius the thing was incredible yet the photograph proved that it existed Rogers interrupts his reverie. Well, what do you think of it? Now do you wonder what crushed the dog and sucked it dry with a million mouths? It needed nourishment, and it will need more. It is a god, and I am the first priest of its latter-day hierarchy. I, Shibnugarath, the goat with a thousand young. Jones lowered the photograph in disgust and pity. See here, Rogers, this won't do. There are limits, you know. It's a great piece of work and all that, but it isn't good for you. Better not see it anymore. Let Orabona break it up and try to forget about it. Let me tear this beastly picture up, too. With a snarl, Roger, Roger snatched the photograph and returned it to the desk. Idiot, you... You still think it's all a fraud. You still think I made it. You still think... My figures are nothing but lifeless wax. Why, damn you, you're a worse clod than a wax mimic yourself. I've got proof this time, and you're going to know. Not just now, for it's resting after the sacrifice, but later. Oh, yes. You will not doubt the power of it then. As Rogers glanced toward the padlock inner door, Jones retrieved his hat and a stick from a nearby bench. Uh, very well, Rogers. Let it be later. I must be going now, but I'll call around tomorrow afternoon. Think my advice over and see if it doesn't sound sensible. Ask Orbona what he thinks, too. Rogers actually bared his teeth in wild beast fashion. Must be going now, eh? Afraid, after all. Afraid for all your bold talk. You say the effigies are only wax, yet you run away when I begin to prove that they aren't. You're like the fellows who take my standing bet that they daren't spend the night in the museum. Then come boldly, they come boldly enough, but after an hour, they shriek and hammer to get out. Want me to ask Orbona, eh? You too, always against me. You want to break down the coming earthly reign of it. Jones preserved his calm. No, Rogers. Nobody's against you. And I am not afraid your figure of your figures either much as I admire your skill. But we're both a bit nervous tonight, and I fancy some rest will do us good. 
Again, Rogers checked his guest's departure. Not afraid, huh? Then why are you so anxious to go? Look here. Do you or don't you dare to stay alone here in the dark? What's your hurry if you don't believe in it? Some new ideas seemed to have struck Rogers, and Jones eyed him closely. Why, I have no special hurry. But what would be gained by my staying here alone? What would it prove? My only objection is that it isn't very comfortable for sleeping. What good would it do either of us? This time, it was Jones who was struck with an idea. He continued in a tone of conciliation. See here, Rogers. I've just asked you what it would prove if I stayed, when we both know. It would prove that your effigies are just effigies, and that you oughtn't to let your imagination go the way it's been going lately. Suppose I do stay. If I stick it out till morning, will you agree to take a new view of things? Go on a vacation for three months or so and let Orbona destroy that new thing of yours? Come. Now isn't that fair? The expression on the showman's face was hard to read. It was obvious that he was thinking quickly, and that of sundry conflicting emotions, malign triumph was getting the upper hand. His voice held a choking quality as he replied, Fair enough. If you do stick it out, I'll take your advice. But stick you must. We'll go out for dinner and come back. I'll lock you in the display room and go home. In the morning, I'll come down ahead of Orabona, he comes in half an hour before the rest, and see how you are. But don't try it unless you're very sure of your skepticism. Others have backed out. You have that chance. And I suppose a pounding on the outer door would always bring the constable. You may not like it so well after a while. You'll be in the same building, though not in the same room with it. As they left the rear door into the dingy Oh, as they left the rear door into the dingy courtyard, Rogers took with him the piece of burlap, weighted with gruesome burden. Near the center of the court was a manhole, whose cover the showman lifted quickly, and with a shuddersome suggestion of familiarity. Burlap and all, the burden went down to the oblivion of a cloacal labyrinth. Jones shuddered and almost shrank from the gaunt figure at his side as they emerged into the street. By unspoken mutual consent, they did not dine together, but agreed to meet in front of the museum at 11. Jones hailed a cab and breathed more freely when he crossed Waterloo Bridge and was approaching the brilliantly lighted Strand. He dined at a quiet cafe and subsequently went to his home in Portland Place to bathe and get a few things. Idly, he wondered what Roger was doing. He had heard... Excuse me. He had heard that the man had a vast, dismal house in the Walworth Road, full of obscure and forbidden books, occult paraphernalia, and wax images which he did not choose to place on exhibition. Orbona, he understood, lived in separate quarters in the same house. At eleven, Jones found Rogers waiting by the basement door in Southwark Street. Their words were few, but each seemed taut with a menacing tension. They agreed that the vaulted exhibition room alone should form the scene of the vigil, and Rogers did not insist that the watcher sit in the special adult alcove of supreme horrors. The showman, having extinguished all the lights with switches in the workroom, locked the door of that crypt with one of the keys on his crowded ring. Without shaking hands, he passed out the street door and locked it after him, and stamped up the worn steps to the sidewalk outside. As his tread receded, Jones realized the long, realized the long, tedious vigil he had commenced. Later in the utter blackness of the great arched cellar, Jones cursed the childish naivete which had brought him there. For the first half hour, he kept flashing on his pocket light at intervals. But now, just sitting in the dark on one of the visitor's benches had become a more nerve-wracking thing. Every time the beam shot out, it lighted up some morbid, grotesque object, a guillotine, 
a nameless hybrid monster, a pasty bearded face crafted with evil, a body with red torrents streaming from a severed throat. Jones know, knew that no sinister reality was attached to these things, but after that first half hour, he preferred not to see them. Why had he bothered to humor that madman he could scarcely imagine? It would have been much simpler mer merely to have let him alone, or to have called in a mental specialist. Probably, he reflected, it was the fellow feeling of one artist for another. There was so much genius in Rogers that he deserted every possible chance to be helped quietly out of his growing mania. Any man who could imagine and construct the incredible lifelike things he had produced was surely not far from actual greatness. He had the fancy of a Sime or Dore, joined to the minute scientific craftsmanship of a Bletchka. Indeed, he had done for the world he had done for the world of nightmare what that Bletchka and their marvelously accurate plant models of finely wrought and colored glass had done for the world of botany. At midnight, the strokes of a distant clock filtered through the darkness, and Jones felt cheered by the message from a still-surviving outside world. The vaulted museum chamber was like a tomb, glass ghastly in utter solitude. Even a mouse would be cheering company, yet Rogers had once boasted that, for certain reasons, as he said, no mice or even insects ever came near the place. That was very curious, yet it seemed to be true. The deadness and silence were virtually complete. If only something would make a sound, he shuffled his feet, and the echoes came spectrally out of the absolute stillness. He coughed, but there was something mocking in the staccato reverberations. He could not, he vowed, begin talking to himself. That meant nervous disintegration. Time seemed to pass with abnormal and disconcerting slowness. He could have sworn that the hours had elapsed since he last flashed the light on his watch, yet here was only the first stroke of midnight. He wished that his senses were not so preternaturally keen. Something in the darkness and stillness seemed to have sharpened them, so that they responded to faint intimations hardly strong enough to be called true impressions. His ears seemed at times to catch a faint elusive cirrhosis which could not quite be identified with the nocturnal hum of the squalid streets outside, and he thought of vague irrelevant things like the music of the spheres and the unknown and accessible life of alien dimensions pressing on our own. Rogers often speculated about such things. The floating specks of light in his blackness-drowned eyes seemed inclined to take on curious symmetries of pattern and motion. He had often wondered about those strange rays from the unplumbed abyss which scintillate before us in the absence of all earthly illumination, but he had never known that any behaved just as they were behaving. They lacked the restful aimlessness of ordinary light specks, suggesting some will and purpose remote from any terrestrial conception. Then there was that suggestion of odd stirrings. Nothing was open, yet in spite of the general draughtlessness Jones felt in the air, that the air was not uniformly quiet. There were intangible variations in pressures, not quite decided enough to suggest that loathsome pawing of unseen elementals. It was abnormally chilly, too. He did not like any of this. The air tasted salty as if it were mixed with the brine of subterranean waters, and there was the bare hint of some odor of ineffable mustiness. In the daytime, he had never noticed that the waxen figures had an odor. Even now, that half-received hint was not the way waxy figures ought to smell. It was more like the faint smell of specimens in a natural history museum. Curious, in view of Roger's claim that his figures were not all artificial. Indeed, it was probably that claim which made one's imagination conjure up the olfactory suspicion. One must guard against excessive excesses of imagination. 
had not such things driven poor Rogers mad? But in the utter loneliness of this place, but the utter loneliness of this place was frightful. Even the distant chimes, which seemed to come from across cosmic gulfs, it made Jones think of that insane picture which Rosard had shoot him. The wildly carved chamber with the cryptic throne, which the fellow had claimed was part of a three million year old ruin in the shunned and inaccessible, inaccessible solitudes of the Arctic. Perhaps Roger had been to Alaska, but that picture was certainly nothing but stage scenery. It couldn't normally be otherwise, with all that carving and those terrible symbols. And that monstrous shape supposed to have been found in that throne. What a flight of diseased fancy. Jones wondered just how far he actually was from the insane masterpiece in wax. Perhaps it was kept behind that heavy padlocked plank door leading somewhere out of the workroom. But it would never do to brood about such a waxen image. Was not the present room full of such things, and some of them scarcely less horrible and dreadful than the dreadful it? And beyond a thin canvas screen on the left was the adults only alcove, with its nameless phantoms of delirium. The proximity of the numberless waxen shapes began to get on Joan's nerves more and more as the quarter hours wore on. He knew the museum so well that he could not get rid of their usual images, even in the total darkness. Indeed, the darkness had the effect of adding to the remembered images certain very disturbing imaginative overtones. The guillotine seemed to creak. The bearded face of Landru, player of his fifty wives, twisted itself into expressions of monstrous menace. From the severed throat of Madame de Mears, a hideous bubbling sound seemed to emanate, while the headless, legless victim of a trunk murderer tried to edge closer and closer on its gory stumps. Jones began shutting his eyes to see if that would dim the images, but found it was useless. Besides, when he shut his eyes, the strange, perf purposeful pattern of light specks became more disturbingly pronounced. Then suddenly, he began trying to keep the hideous images he had formerly been trying to banish. He tried to keep them because they were giving place to still more hideous ones. In spite of himself, his memory began reconstructing the utterly non-human blasphemies that lurked in the obscure corners, and these lumpish hybrid growths oozed and wriggled towards him, as though hunting him down in a circle. Black Sagoa, Gotha, Sagoa molded itself from a toad-like gargoyle to a long, sinuous line, with hundreds of rudimentary feet and a lean, rubbery, night-gaunt spread its wings as if to advance and smother the watcher. Jones braced himself to keep from screaming. He knew he was reverting to the traditional terrors of his childhood and resolved to use his adult reason to keep the phantoms at bay. It helped a bit, he found, to flash the light again. Frightful as it were, the frightful as the, the images it shewed, these were not as bad as what his fancy called out of the utter blackness. But there were drawbacks. Even in the light of his torch, he could not help suspecting a, uh, suspecting a slight furtive trembling on the part of the canvas partition screening off the d terrible adults-only alcove. He knew what lay beyond and shivered. Imagination called up the shocking forms of fabulous yog -Sothoth. Only a congeries of iridescent globes, yet stupendous in its malign suggestiveness. What was this accursive mass slowly floating towards him and bumping on the partition that stood in the way? A small budge in the canvas to the far right suggested the sharp home of Nukke, the hairy myth thing of the Greenland ice that walked sometimes on two legs, sometimes on four, and sometimes on six. To get this stuff out of his head, 
Jones walked boldly forward towards the hellish alcove with his torch burning steadily. Of course, none of his fears were true. Yet, were not the long, facial tentacles of Great Cthulhu actually swaying, slowly and insidiously? He knew they were flexible, but he had not realized that the drop caused by his advance was enough to send them in motion. Returning to his former seat outside the alcove, he shut his eyes and let the symmetrical light specks do their worst. The distant clock boomed a single stroke. Could it only be one? He flashed the light on his watch and saw that it was precisely that hour. It would be hard indeed waiting for morning. Rogers would be down at about eight o'clock, ahead of even Orabona. He, it would be light outside in the main basement long before that. But none of it could penetrate here. All the windows in the basement had been bricked up, but three small ones facing the court. A pretty bad wait, all told. His ears were getting most of the hallucinations now, for he could swear he heard stealthy, plodding footsteps in the workroom beyond the closed, locked door. He had no business thinking of that unexhibited horror which Rogers called it. The thing was a contamination. It had driven its maker mad, and now even its picture was calling up imaginative terrors. It could not be in the workroom. It was very obviously beyond that padlocked door of heavy planking. Those steps were p certainly pure imagination. Then he thought he heard the key turn in the workroom door. Flashing on the torch, he saw nothing but the ancient six-panel portal in its proper position. Again, he tried darkness and closed his eyes. But there, were f but there followed a herring illusion of creaking. Not the guillotine this time, but slow, furtive opening of the workroom door. He would not scream. Once he screamed, he would be lost. There was a sort of padding or shuffling audible now and it was slowly advancing towards him. He must retain command of himself. Had he not done so when the nameless brain shapes tried to close in on him, the shuffling crept nearer, and his resolution failed. He did not scream, but nearly gulped out a challenge. Who goes there? Who are you? What do you want? There was no answer, but the shuffling kept on. Jones did not know which he feared most to do turn on his flashlight or stay in the dark while the thing crept upon him. The thing was different, he felt profoundly, from the other terrors of the evening. His fingers and throat worked spasmodically. Silence was impossible, and the suspense of utter blackness was beginning to be the most intolerable of all conditions. Again, he cried out hysterically, Halt! Who goes there? As he switched on the revealing beams of his torch, then paralyzed by what he saw. He dropped the flashlight and screamed, not once, but many times. Shuffling towards him in the darkness was the gigantic, blasphemous form of a black thing, not wholly ape, but and not wholly insect. Its hide hung loosely upon its frame, and its ragose, dead eyes, rudiment of a head straight, swayed drunkenly from side to side. Its forepaws were extended, with talons spread wide, and its whole body was taunt with murderous malignity, despite its utter lack of facial expression. After the screams and the final coming of its darkness, it leaped, and in a moment had Jones pinned to the floor. There was no struggle, for the Watcher had fainted. Jones' fainting spell could not have lasted more than a moment, for the nameless thing was ablishly dragging him through the darkness when he began recovering consciousness. What startled him fully awake were the sounds which the thing was making, or rather, the voice with which it was making them. The voice was human, and it was familiar. Only one living thing could be behind the horror's feverish accents, which were chanting in an unknown to an unknown horror. Ai, ai, it was howling. I'm coming, O Ron Tigoth. Coming with the nourishment, you have waited long and fed ill, but now you shall have what was promised, that and more, for instead of Orabona, it will be one of high degree who had doubted you, 
You shall crush and drain him with all his doubts, and grow stronger thereby. And even after among men he shall be shewn as a monument to your glory. Ren Tegoth, infinite and invincible, I am your slave and high priest. You are hungry, and I provide. I read the sign, and you and have led you forth. I shall feed you with blood, and you shall feed me with power. I Shibnugarath, the goat with a thousand young. In an instant, all the terror of the night dropped from Jones like a discarded cloak. He was again the master of his mind, for he knew the very earthly and material peril he had to deal with. There was no monster of fable, but a dangerous madman. It was Rogers, dressed in some nightmare covering of his own insane design, and about to make a frightful sacrifice to the devil god he had fashioned out of wax. Clearly, he must have entered the workroom from the rear courtyard, donned his disguise, and then advanced to seize his neatly trapped and fear-broken victim. His strength was prodigious, and if he was to be thwarted, one must act quickly. Counting on the madman's confidence in his unconsciousness, he determined to take him by surprise, while his grasp was relatively lax. The feel of a threshold told him he was crossing into the pitch-black workroom. With the strength of a mortal fear, Jones, Jones made a sudden spring for the half recumbent posture, uh, from the half recumbent posture from which he was being dragged. For an instant, he was free of the astonished maniac's hands, and in another instant, a lucky lunge in the dark had put his own hands at his captor's weirdly concealed throat. Simultaneously, Rogers gripped him again, and without further preliminaries, the two were locked in a desperate struggle of life and death. Jones' athletic training, without a doubt, was his sole salvation for, for his mad assailant, freed from every inhibition of fair play, decency, or even self-preservation, was an engine of savage destruction as formidable as a wolf or panther. Guttural cries sometimes punctu punctured the hideous tussle in the dark. Blood spurted, clothing ripped, and Jones at last felt the actual throat of the maniac, shorn of its spectral mask. He spoke not a word, but put every ounce of energy into the fence of his life. Rogers kicked, gouged, butted, bit, clawed, and spat, yet found strength to yelp out actual sentences at times. Most of his speech was ritualistic jargon full of references to it, or ran to goth. And to Joan's overwrought nerves, it seemed as if the cries echoed from an infinite distance of demonic snortings and bayings. Towards the last, they were rolling on the floor overturning benches or striking against the walls and the brick foundation of the central melting furnace. Up to the very end, Jones could not be certain of saving himself, but chance finally intervened in his favor. A jab of his knee against Roger's chest produced a general relaxation, and a moment later, he knew he had won. Though hardly able to hold himself up, Jones rose and stumbled about the walls seeking the light switch for his flashlight was gone, together with most of his clothing. As, lur as he lurched along, he dragged his lip opponent with him, fearing a sudden attack when the madman came to. Finding the switch box, he fumbled till he had the right handle. Then, as the wildly disordered workroom burst into sudden radiance, he set about binding Rogers with such cords and belts as he could easily find. The fellow's disguise, or what was left of it, seemed to be made of a puzzling queer sort of leather. For some reason, it made Joan's flesh crawl to touch it, and there seemed to be an alien rusty odor about it. In the normal clothes beneath it was Roger's key ring, and this the exhausted victor seized as his final passport to freedom. The shades at the small, slit-like windows were all securely drawn, and he let them remain so. Washing the blood of battle, Washing off the blood of battle at a convenient sink, Jones donned the most ordinary-looking and least ill-fitting clothes he could find on the costume hooks. Testing the door to the courtyard, he found it fastened with a spring lock, which did not require a key from the inside. He kept the key ring, however, to admit him on his return with aid, for plainly the thing to do was to call an alienist. There was no telephone in the museum but it would not take long to find an all-night restaurant or chemist's shop where one could be had. He had almost opened the door, 
to go when a torrent of hideous abuse from across the room told him that Rogers, whose visible injuries were confined to a large, deep scratch down the left cheek, had regained consciousness. Fool, son of Noth Yudik, an effluvum of Cthune, son of the dogs that howl in the maelstrom of Azathoth, you would have been sacred and immortal, and now you are betraying it and its priests. Beware, for it is hungry. It would have been Orabona, the damned treacherous dog ready to turn against me and it. But I give you the first honor instead. Now you both must beware, for it is not gentle without its priests. Ah, uh, yeah. Vengeance is at hand. Do you know you would have been immortal? Look at the furnace. There is a light ready. There is a fire ready to light, and there is wax in the kettle. I would have done with you as I have done with other once living forms. Here, yeah. you would have vowed all my effigies are waxen. It would have become a waxen effigy yourself. The furnace was all ready. When it had had its fill, and you were like that dog I shooed you, I would have made your flattened, punctured fragments immortal. Wax would have done it. Haven't you said I'm a great artist? Wax in every pore. Wax over every square inch of you. Yeah, yeah. And even after the world would have looked at your mangled carcass and wondered how I ever ma imagined and made such a thing. Hey, yeah. And Orobona would have come next, and others after him. And thus would my waxen family have grown. Dog, do you still think I made all my effigies? Why not say preserved? You know by this time the strange places I've been to, the strange things I've brought back. Coward, you could never face the dimensional shambler whose hide I put on to scare you. The mere sight of it alive, or even the full-fledged thought of it, would kill you instantly with fright. Ai, ai. It awaits hungry for the blood that is the life. Rogers propped against the wall, swayed to and fro in his bonds. See here. Jones, if I let you go... Will you let me go? It must be taken care of by its high priest. Orabona will be enough to keep it alive. And when he is finished, I will make his fragments immortal and wax for the world to see. It could have been you, but you have rejected the honor. I won't bother you again. Let me go, and I will share with you the power that it will bring me. Aya, aya, great Ren Tagoth. Let me go, let me go, it's starving down there beyond that door. And if it dies, the old ones can never come back. Hey, I, hey, I, let me go. Jones merely shook his head. Though the hideousness of the showman's imaginations revolted him. Rogers, now staring wildly at the plate-locked plank door, thumped his head again and again against the brick wall and kicked it with his tightly bound ankles. Jones was afraid he would injure himself and advance to bind him more firmly to some stationary object. Writhing, Jones edged away from him and set up a series of frenetic ululations whose utter monstrous inhumanness was appalling and whose sheer volume was almost incredible. It seemed impossible that any human throat could produce so loud and piercing, could produce noises so loud and piercing, and Jones felt that if this continued, there would be no need to telephone for aid. It could not be long before a constable would investigate, even granting that there were no listening neighbors, even this, the deserted warehouse district. Wazare, Wazare, howled the madman. Yaka, habo, eh, ran tegoth, Cthulhu, fatagan, eh, 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 ran tegoth, ran tegoth, ran tegoth. The tauntly trussed creature, who had started squirming his way across the littered floor, now reached the padlocked plank door and commenced knocking his head thunderously against it. Jones dreaded taking the binding, the task of binding him further, and wished he were not so exhausted from the previous struggle. This violent aftermath was getting hideously on his nerves, and he began to feel a return of the nameless qualms he had felt in the dark. Everything about Rogers and his museum was so hellishly morbid and suggestive of black vistas beyond life. It was loathsome to think that of the waxen mastered piece of abnormal... I need to take a drink, obviously. Hey, Optimist. Okay. 
Okay, where was I? It was loathsome to think of the waxen masterpiece of abnormal genius, which must be at this very moment lurking close at hand in the blackness beyond the heavy, padlocked door. And now something happened which sent an additional chill down Joan's spine and caused every hair and even the tiny growth on the back of his hands to bristle with a vague fright beyond classification. Rogers had suddenly stopped screaming and beating his head against the stout plate door and was straining up to a sitting posture, head cocked on one side as if listening intently for something. All at once a smile of devilish triumph overspread his face and he began speaking intelligibly again this time in a hoarse whisper, contrasting oddly with his former stentorian howling. Listen, fool. Listen hard. It has heard me and is coming. Can't you hear it splashing out of its tank down there at the end of the runway? I dug it deep because there was nothing too good for it. It's amphibious, you know. You saw the gills in that picture. It came from Earth. It came to the Earth from Lead Grey Yugoth where the cities are under the warm, deep sea. It can't stand up in there. Too tall. It has to sit or crouch. Let me get my keys. We must let it out and kneel before it. Then we will go out and find a cat or dog or perhaps a drunken man and give it the nourishment it needs. It was not the, what the man-man said, but the way he said it that disorganized Joan so badly. The utter insane confidence and sincerity in that crazed whispers were damnably contagious. Imagination was such a stimulus could find an active menace in the devilish wax figure that lurked unseen just beyond the heavy planking. Eyeing the door in unholy fashion, Jones noticed that it bore several distinct cracks though no marks of violent treatment were visible on this side. He wondered how large a room or closet lay behind it, and how the waxen figure was arranged. The maniac's idea of a tank and runway was as clever as all his other imaginings. Then, in one terrible instant, Jones completely lost the power to draw a breath. The leather belt he had seized for Roger's further strapping fell limp from his hands, and a spasm of shivering convulsed him from head to foot. He might have known the place would drive him mad as it had Roger's, and now he was mad. He was mad, for now he harbored hallucinations more weird than any which had assailed him earlier that night. The madman was bidding him near the splashing of a mythical monster in a tank beyond the door, and now, God help him, he did hear it. Rogers saw the spasm of horror reach Joan's face and transform it into a scaring mask of fear. He cackled. At last, fool, you believe. At last, you know. You hear it, and it comes. Give me my keys, fool. We must do homage and serve it. But Jones was past paying attention to any human words, mad or sane. Phobic paralysis held him immobile and half-conscious, with wild images racing phantasmagorically through his helpless imagination. There was a splashing. There was a padding or shuffling, as of great wet paws on a solid surface. Something was approaching. Into his nostrils from the cracks in that nightmare plank door poured a noisome animal stench. Like, and yet unlike, that of mammal cages at the zoological gardens in Regent's Park. He did not know now whether Rogers was talking or not. Everything real had faded away, and he was a statue obsessed with dreams and hallucinations, so unnatural that they became almost objects, objectives and remote from him. He thought he heard a sniffing or snorting in the unknown gulf beyond the door, and when a sudden baying, trumpeting noise assailed his ears, he could not feel sure that it came from the tightly bound maniac whose image swam uncertainly in a shaken vision. The photograph of that uncursed, unseen wax thing persisted in floating through his consciousness. Such a thing had no right to exist. Had it not driven him mad? Even as he reflected, a fresh evidence of madness beset him. Something, he thought, was fumbling with the latch of the heavy padlocked door. It was padding and pawing and pushing at the planks. 
There was a thudding on the stout wood, which grew louder and louder. The stench was horrible, and now the assault on that door from the inside was a malign, determined pounding, like the strokes of a battering ram. There was an ominous cracking, a splintering, a welling fetter, a falling plank, black paw ending in a crab-like claw. Help! Help! God help me! With intense effort, Jones is today able to recall a sudden bursting of his fear paralysis into the liberation of frenzied and an automatic flight. What he evidently what he evidently did must have paralleled curiously the wild plunging flights of maddest nightmares for he seemed to have leaped across the disordered crypt at almost a single bound yanked open the outside door which closed and locked itself after him with a clatter sprung up the worn stone steps three at a time and raced frantically aimlessly out of that dank cobbled stone courtyard and through the squalid streets of Southwark here the memory ends Jones does not know how he got home, and there is no evidence of his having hired a cab. Perhaps he raced all the way by blind instinct, over Waterloo Bru Bridge, across the Strand, in Charing Cross, up Haymarket in Regent Street to his own neighborhood. He still had on the queer melange of museum costumes when he grew conscious enough to call the doctor. A week later, the nerve specialist allowed him to leave his bed and walk in the open air. But he had not told the specialist much. Over his whole experience hold a, hung a pow of madness and nightmare, and he felt that silence was the only course. When he was up, he scanned intently all the papers which had accumul accumulated since that hideous night, but found no reference to anything queer at the museum. How much, after all, had been reality? Where did reality end and morbid dream begin? Had his mind gone wholly to pieces in that dark, Ex exhibition chamber, and had the whole fight with Rogers been a phantasm of fever? It would help him to put his put. It would help to put him on his feet if he could settle some of these maddening points. He must have seen that damnable photograph of the wax image called it, for no brain but Rogers could have ever conceived such a blasphemy. It was a fortnight before he dared enter Southwark Street again. He went in the middle of the morning, but when there was the greatest amount of sane, wholesome activity around the ancient, crumbling shops and warehouses. The museum sign was still there, and as he approached, he saw the place was open. The gateman nodded in present recollection, a recognition, as he summoned up the courage to enter, and in the vaulted chamber below, an attendant touched his cap cheerfully. Perhaps everything had been a dream. Would he dare knock at the door of the workroom and knock and look for Rogers? Then Orabona advanced to greet him. His dark, sleek face was a trifle sardonic, but Jones felt he was not unfriendly. He spoke with a trace of an accent. Good morning, Mr. Jones. It's been some time since we have seen you here. Did you wish to see Mr. Rogers? I'm sorry, but he is away. He had a word of business in America and had to go. Yes, it was very sudden. I am in charge now, here, and at the house. I try to maintain Mr. Rogers' high standards, till he is back. The foreigner smiled, perhaps from affability alone. Jones scarcely knew how to reply, but managed to mumble out a few inquiries about the day after his last visit. Orbona seemed greatly amused by the questions, and took considerable care in framing his replies. Oh, yes. Mr. Jones, the 28th of last month. I remember it for many reasons. In the morning, before Mr. Rogers got here, you understand. I found the workroom in quite a rest. There was a great deal of cleaning up to do. There had been late work, you see. Important new specimen, given its secondary baking process, and I took complete charge when I came. It was a hard specimen to prepare, but of course, Mr. Rogers has taught me a great deal. He is, you know, a very great artist. But when he came, he helped me complete the specimen. Helped me very materially, I assure you. But he left soon without even greeting the men. As I tell you, he was called away very suddenly. There was an important chemical reactions involved. They made loud noises. In fact, some teamsters in the court outside fancy they heard several pistol shots. Very amusing idea. 
As for the new specimen, that matter is very unfortunate. The great masterpiece designed and made you understand by Mr. Rogers. He will see about it when he gets back. Again, Orabona smiled. The police, you know, we put it on display a week ago, and there were two or three faintings. One poor fellow had an epileptic fit in front of it. You see, it's a trifle stronger than the rest. Larger, for one thing. Of course, it, it was in the adult alcove. Next day, a couple of men from Scotland Yard looked it over and said it was too morbid to be shewn. Said we'd have to remove it. It was a tremendous shame. Such a masterpiece of art. But I didn't feel it but I didn't feel justified in appealing to the courts in Mr. Rogers' absence. He would not like so much publicity with the police now. But when he gets back, when he gets back. For some reason or other, Jones felt a mounting tide of uneasiness and repulsion. But Orabona was continuing. You are a connoisseur, Mr. Jones. I am sure I violate no law in offering you a private view. It may be subject, of course, to Mr. Rogers' wishes that we shall destroy the specimen someday. That would be a crime. Jones had a powerful impulse to refuse the sight and flee precipitously, but Orabona was leading him forward by the arm with an artist's enthusiasm. The adult alcove, crowded with nameless horrors, held no visitors. In the farthest corner, a large niche had been curtained off, and to this the smiling and assistant advanced. You must know, Mr. Jones, that the title of the specimen is the sacrifice to run to goth. Jones started violently, but Orabona appeared not to notice. The shapeless colossal god is a feature in certain obscure legends which Mr. Rogers has studied. All nonsense, of course. So, as you've so often assured Mr. Rogers, it's supposed to have come from outer space and to have lived in the Arctic three million years ago. It treated its sacrifices rather peculiarly and horribly, as you shall see. Mr. Rogers made it fiendishly lifelike, even to the face of the victim. Now trembling, violently, Jones clung to the glass railing in front of the curtained niche. He almost reached out to stop Orbona when he saw the curtain beginning to swing aside. But some conflicting impulse held him back. The foreigner smiled triumphantly. Behold! John Jones reeled in spite of his grip on the railing. God! Great God! Fully ten feet high, despite a shambling, crouching attitude, expressive of infin infinite cosmic malignancy, a monstrosity of unbelievable horror, was Shun starting forward from a cyclopean ivory throne covered with grotesque carvings. In the center, in the central pair of its six legs, it bore crushed, flattened, distorted, bloodless thing, riddled with a million punctures and in places seared with some pungent acid. Only the mangled head of the victim, lolling up upside down at one side, revealed that it resembled something once human. The monster itself needed no title for one who had seen a certain hellish photograph. That damnable print had been all too faithful, yet it could not carry the full horror which lay in the gigantic actuality, the globular toso, torso, the bubble-like suggestions of the head, the three fishy eyes, the foot-long proboscis, bulging gills, the monstrous capillation of asp-like suckers, the six sinuous limbs with their black paws and crab-like claws. God, the familiarity of that black paw ending in a crab-like claw. Orabona smiled and was utterly damnable. Jones choked and stared at the hideous exhibit with a mounting fascination which perplexed and disturbed him. What half-revealed horror was holding and forcing him to look longer and search out details. This had driven Rogers mad, Rogers supreme artists, and they weren't artificial. Then he localized the thing that held him. It was the crushed waxen vixen's lolling head and something that it implied. This head was not entirely devoid of a face, and that face was familiar. It was like the mad face of poor Rogers. Jones peered closer, hardly knowing why he was driven so driven to do so. Wasn't it natural for a mad ignatist to mold his own features into his masterpiece? 
Was there anything more subconscious, anything more that subconscious vision had seized on and suppressed in sheer terror? The wax of the mangled face had been handled with boundless dexterity. Those punctures, how perfectly they reproduced the myriad wounds somehow inflicted on that poor dog. But there was something more. On the left cheek, one could trace an irregularity which seemed outside the general scheme. As if the sculptor had sought to cover up a def deficit of his first modeling. The more Jones looked at it, the more mysteriously it horrified him. And then suddenly he remembered a circumstance which brought his horror to a head. That night of hideousness, the tussle, the bound madman, and a long, deep scratch down the left cheek of the actually living Rogers. Jones released his desperate clutch on the railing and sank in a total faint. Orabona continued to smile. And that, my friends, is the end of the horror in the museum. That one's pretty good. Hola. Buenas noches, super. Thanks for stopping by. Alright, let me take a look at how long the thing on the doorstep is. Yeah, I had a really good, uh... Really good pace. I don't think the thing on the doorstep looked that long. Aw, well thank you for st staying here anyway, Avery. It's not like it's that scary. Yeah, so we're looking at 20 something pages. I can do that. I actually love horror. I don't know why anybody would say. Bedtime stories are the best. Alright. Um, okay. The thing on the doorstep. It is true that I have sent six bullocks through the head of my best friend, yet I hope to shew by this statement that I am not his murderer. At first I shall be called a madman, madder than when the man madder than the man I shot in his cell at the Arkham Sanitarium. Later, some of my readers will weigh each statement, correlate it with known facts, and ask themselves how I could have believed otherwise than as I did after facing the evidence of that horror, that thing on the doorstep. Until then, I also saw nothing but madness in the wild tales I have acted on. Even now I ask myself whether I was misled, or whether I am not mad after all. I do not know. But others have strange things to tell of Edward and Asnath Derby. And even the stolid police are at their wit's end to account for that last terrible visit. They have tried weakly to concoct a theory of ghastly jest or warning by discharged servants, yet they know in their hearts that the truth is something infinitely more terrible and incredible. So I say that I have not murdered Edward Derby. Rather, I have avenged him, and in doing so purged the earth of a horror whose survival might have loosed untold terrors on all mankind. There are black zones of shadow close to our daily paths, and now and then some evil soul breaks a passage through. When that happens, the man who knows must strike before reckoning the consequences. I have known Edward Pickman Derby all his life. Eight years my junior, he was so precocious that we had much in common from the time he was eight and I sixteen. He was the most phenomenal child scholar I have ever known, and at seven was writing verses of somber, fantastic, and almost morbid cast, which astounded the tutors surrounding him. Perhaps his private education and coddled seclusion had something to do with his premature flowering, 
an only child, he had organic weaknesses which startled his doting parents and caused them to keep him closely chained to their side. He was with other children. He was never allowed out without his nurse and seldom had a chance to play unconstrainedly with other children. All this doubtless fostered a strange, secretive inner life in the boy, with imagination as his one avenue of freedom. At any rate, his juvenile learning was prodigious and bizarre, and his facile writing such as, captiv such as to captivate me despite my greater age. About that time, I had learning... Oh, wait. I turned the page and I don't think I had that word right. Damn it. Oh, I had leanings toward an art of somewhat grotesque cast, and I found myself and I found in this younger child a rare kindred spirit. What lay beyond our joint love of shadows and marvels was, no doubt, the ancient, moldering, and subtly fearsome town in which we lived, which cursed, legend hunted, haunted Arkham, whose huddled, sagging, gambrel roofs and crumbling Gar Georgian balustrades brood over the centuries brood out the centuries beside the darkly muttering miskatonic as time went by I turned to architecture and gave up my design of illustrating a book of Edward's demonic poems yet our comradeship suffered no lessening young Derby's odd genius developed remarkably and his 18th in in his 18th year his collected nightmare lyrics made a real sensation when issued under the title Azathoth and Other Horrors. He was a close correspondent of the notorious Bolarian poet Justin, Jeff Justin Jeffrey, who wrote The People of the Monolith and died screaming in a madhouse in 1926 after a visit to a sinister, ill-regarded village in Hungary. In self-reliance and practical affairs, however, Derby was greeted was greatly retarded because of his coddled existence. His health had improved, but his habits of childish dependence were fostered by overcareful parents, so that he was never traveled alone. Hi, Jason. Hi, Argo. So that he never traveled alone, made independent decisions, or assumed responsibilities. It was early seen that he would not be equal to a struggle in the business or professional arena, but the family fortune was so ample that this formed no tragedy. As he grew to years of manhood, he retained a deceptive active aspect of boyishness. Blonde and blue-eyed, he had the fresh complexion of a child, and his attempts to raise a mustache were discernibly only with difficulty. His voice was soft and light and his pampered, unexercised life gave him a juvenile chubbiness rather than the paunchiness of premature middle age. He was of good height, and his handsome face would have made him a notable gallant had not his shyness held him to seclusion and bookishness. Night Drama Derby's parents took him abroad every summer, and he was quick to seize on the surface aspects of European thought and expression. His Poe-like talents turned more and more towards the decadent, and other artistic sensitivities and yearnings were half aroused in him. We had great discussions in those days. I had been through Harvard and studied in Boston's architect's office, had married, and had finally returned to Arkham to practice my profession, settling in the Fondly homestead in Stalin Street, Stal Stalton Street. Stalton Stall Street? Stalton Stall Street. Wow, that's a word since my father had moved to Florida for his health. Edward used to call almost every evening till I came to regard him as one of the household. He had a characteristic way of ringing the doorbell or sounding the knocker that grew to be a veritable code signal, so that after dinner I always listened for the familiar three brisk strokes, followed by two more after a pause. Less frequently, I would visit at his house and note with envy the obscure volumes in his constantly growing library. Derby went through Miskatonic University in Ar Arkham, since his parents would not let him board away from them. He entered at 16 and completed his course in three years, majoring in English and French literature and receiving high marks in everything but mathematics and the sciences. 
he mingled very little with the other students, though looking enviously at the daring O Bohemian set, whose superficially smart language and meaningless ironic pose he aped, and whose dubious conduct he wished to he wished he dared adopt. What he did do to become an almost fanatical devotee of subterranean magical lore, for which Miskatonic's library was famous and is famous. Always a dweller on the surface of fantasy and strangeness, he now delved deep into the actual runes and riddles left by a fabulous past in the guidance or puzzlements of posterity. He read things like the frightful Book of Ebon, the Ospreklin Kulten of John von Junst, and the forbidden Necronomicon of the mad Arab Arab Edbul al Hazred. Though he did not tell his parents he had seen them. Edward was twenty when my son and only child was born, and seemed very pleased when I named the newcomer Edward Derby Upton after him. By the time he was twenty-five, Edward Derby was a prodigiously learned man and a fairly well-known poet in Fentiste, though his lack of contacts and responsibilities had slowed down his literary growth by making his products deviate, uh, derivative and overbookish. I was perhaps his closest friend, finding him an inexhaustible mine of vital theoro theoretical topics while he relied on me for advice on whatever matters he did not wish to refer to his parents. He, remangled, he remained single, though a more through shyness, inertia, and parental protectiveness than through inclination, and moved in society only to the slightest and most perfunctory extent. When the war came, both health and ingrained timidity kept him at home. I went to Plattsburgh for a commission, but never got overseas. So the years wore on. Edward's mother died when he was 34, and for months he was incapacitated by some odd psychological malady. His father took him to Europe, however, and he managed to pull out of his trouble without visible effects. Afterwards, he seemed to feel a sort of grotesque exhilaration, as, is, as if of partial escape from some unseen bondage. He began to man mingle with the more advanced college set despite his middle age and was present at some extremely wild doings. On one occasion, paying heavy blackmail, which he borrowed of me, to keep his presence at a certain affair from his father's notice. Some of the whispered rumors about the wild Miskatonic set were extremely singular. There was even talk of black magic and of happenings beyond utter credibility. Edward was 38 when he met Asneth White, wait, she was, I judge, about 23 at the time, and was taking a special course in the medieval metaphysical metaphysics at Miskatonic. The daughter of a friend of mine had met her before, in the hall school at Kingsport, and had been inclined to shun her because of her odd reputation. She was dark, smallish, and very good-looking, except for over-protuberant eyes, but something in her expression alienated extremely sensitive people. It was, however largely her origin and conversation which caused average folk to avoid her. She was one of the Innsmouth Waits, and dark legends have clustered for generations about crumbling, half-deserted Innsmouth and its people. There are tales of horrible bargains about the year 1850, and of a strange element not quite human in the ancient families of the run-down fishing port. Tales is tales such as only old-time Yankees can devise and repeat with proper awesomeness. As this case was aggravated by the fact that she was Ephraim Waite's daughter, the child of his old age by an unknown wife who was always veiled, Ephraim lived in a half-decayed mansion in Washington Street, Innsmouth, and those who had seen the place, Arkham folk who avoid going to Innsmouth whenever they can, declared that the attic windows were always boarded, and that strange sounds sometimes floated from within as evening drew on. The old man was known to have been a prodigious magical student in his day, and legend averred that he could raise or quell storms at sea according to his whim. I had seen him once or twice in my youth as he came to Arkham to consult forbidden tomes at the college library, and had hated his wolfish, saturnine face and its, with its tangible tangle of iron-gray beard. 
He had died insane, under rather queer circumstances, just before his daughter, by his will, made a nominal ward of the principal, entered the hall school, but she had been his morbidly avid pupil and looked fiendishly like him at times. The friend whose daughter had gone to school with Asna Swate repeated many curious things when the news of Edward's acquaintances with her began to spread about. Asnith, it, said, it seemed, had poised as a kind of magician at school, and had really seemed to be a able to accomplish some highly baffling marvels. She professed to be able to raise thunderstorms, though seeing her success was generally laid to some uncanny knack at prediction. All animals markedly disliked her, and she could make any dog howl by a certain motion of her right hand. There were times when she displayed snatches of knowledge and language very singular and very shocking for a young girl, when she would frighten her schoolmates with leers and winks of an inexplicable kind, and would seem to extra extract an obscene and zesty irony from her present situation. Most unusual, though, were the well-attested cases of her influence over other persons. She was, beyond question, a genuine hypnotist. By gazing peculiarly at a few fellow student, she would often give the latter a distinct feeling of exchanged personality, as if the subject were placed momentarily in the magician's body and able to stare half across the room at her real body, whose eyes blazed and protruded with an alien expression. Asnith often made wild claims about the nature of consciousness and its independence of the physical form, or at least from the life processes of the physical frame. Her crowning rage, however, was that she was not a man, since she believed the male brain had certain unique and far-reaching cosmic powers. Given a man's brain, she declared, she could not only equal but surpass her father in masteries of unknown forces. Edward met Asnath at a gathering of intelligentsia, held in one of the student rooms, and could talk of nothing else when he came to see me the next day. He had found her full of the interests and erudition which had engrossed him the most, and was in addition wildly taken with her appearance. I had never seen the young woman, and recalled casual references only faintly, but I knew who she was. It seemed rather regrettable that Derby should become so upheaved about her, but I said nothing to discourage him, since infatuation thrives on opposition. He was not, he said, mentioning her to his father. In the next few weeks, I heard very little but Asnath from young Derby. Others now remarked Edward's autumnal gallantry, though they agreed that he did not look even nearly his actual age. Or seem at all inappropriate as an escort for his bizarre divinity. He was only a trifle paunchy despite his indolence and self-indulgence, and his face was absolutely without lines. Asnath, on the other hand, had the premature crow's feet, which came from the exercise of an intense will. About this time, Edward brought the girl to call on me, and I at once saw that his interest was by no means one-sided. She eyed him continually, with an almost predatory air, and I perceived that their intimacy was beyond untangling. Soon afterward, I had a visit from old Mr. Derby, whom I had always admired and respected. He had heard the tales of his son's new friendship, and had wormed the whole truth out of the boy. Edward meant to marry Asnath, and had told and had even been looking at houses in the suburbs. Knowing my usual great influence with his son, the father wondered if I could help break the ill advised affair off, but I regrettably expressed my doubt. This time it was not a question of Edward's weak will, but of the woman's strong will. The perennial child had transferred his dependence from the parental image to a new, stronger image, and nothing could be done about it. The wedding was performed a month later, by a justice of the peace according to the bride's request. Mr. Derby, at my advice, offered no opposition, and he, my wife, and my son, and I attended the brief ceremony the other guests being wild young people from the college. Asnath had brought the old crown, sh crown and shield place in the country at the end of High Street, and they proposed to settle there after a short trip to Innsmouth, whence three servants and some books and household goods were to be brought. 
It was probably not so much consideration for Edward and his father as a personal wish to be near the college, its library, and its crowd of sophisticates that made Asneth settle in Arkham instead of returning permanently home. When Edward called on me after the honeymoon, I thought he looked slightly changed. Asneth had made him get rid of the undeveloped mustache, but there was more than that. He looked soberer and more thoughtful. His habitual pout of childish n rebellion, n rebelliousness being exchanged for a look of almost genuine sadness. I was puzzled to decide whether I liked or disliked the change. Certainly, he seemed for the moment more normal than uh, more normally adult than ever. Perhaps the marriage was a good thing. Might not the change of dependence start toward an actual neutralization, leading ultimately to in responsible independence? He came alone, for Asnath was very busy. She had brought a vast book store of books and apparatus from Innsmouth. Derby shuddered as he spoke the name, and was finishing the restoration of the Crowninshield house and grounds. Her home in that town was a rather disquieting place, but certain objects in it had taught him some surprising things. He was progressing fast enough in esoteric lore now that he had Asnath's guidance. Some of the experiments she proposed were very daring and radical. He did not feel at liberty to describe them, but he had confidence in her power and, int and intentions. The three servants were very queer, an incredibly aged couple who had been with old Ephraim and referred occasionally to him and to his Asnath's dead mother in cryptic way, and a swarthy young wench who had marked ab had marked ab anomalies of features and seemed to exclude a perpetual order of fish. For the next two years, I saw less and less of Derby. A fortnight would sometimes slip by without the familiar three and, or three and two strokes at the front door. And when he did call, or when, as happened with increasing infrequency, I called on him, he was very little disposed to converse on vital topics. He had become secretive about those occult studies which he used to describe and discuss so minutely, and preferred not to talk of his wife. She had aged tremendously since her marriage, till now, oddly enough, she seemed the elder of the two. Her face held the most concentratedly determined expression I had ever seen, and her whole aspect seemed to gain a vague, unplaceable repulsiveness. My wife and son noticed it as much as I, and we all ceased gradually to call on her, for which Edward admitted in one of his boyishly tactless moments she was unmitigatedly grateful. Occasionally, the Derbies would go on long trips, ostensibly to Europe, though Edward sometimes hinted at obscure destinations. It was after the first year that the people began talking about the change in Edward Derby. It was very casual talk, for the change was purely psychological, but it brought up some interesting points. Now and then, it seemed, Edward was observed to wear an expression and do things wholly incompatible with his usual flabby nature. For example, although in the old days he could not drive a car, he was now seen occasionally to dash out into or out of the old crown and shield driveway with Asna's powerful Packard, handling it like a master and meeting traffic entanglements with a skill and determination utterly alien to his accustomed nature. In such cases, he always he seemed always to be just back from some trip or just starting on one. What sort of trip, no one could guess, although he mostly favored the Innsmouth Road. Oddly, the metamos... Excuse me, I need to take a drink. Where did I live off? Oddly, the metamorphosis did not seem altogether pleasing. People said he looked too much like his wife, or like old Ephraim Waite himself in these moments. Or perhaps these moments seemed unnatural because they were so rare. Sometimes, hours after starting out in this way, he would return listlessly sprawled on the rear seat of his car, where an obviously hired chauffeur or mechanic drove. 
obvious also his preponderant aspect on the streets during his decreasing round of social contacts, including, I may say, his calls on me, was the old-time indecisive one, the irresponsible childishness, even more marked than in the past. While Asna's face aged, Edwards, aside from these exceptional occasions, actually relaxed into an exaggerated immaturity, save when a trace of the new sadness or understanding would flash across it. It was really very puzzling. Meanwhile, the Derbies almost dropped out of the gay college circle, though not through their own design, we heard, but because something about their present studies shocked even the most callous of other decadents. It was in the third year of marriage that Edward began to hint openly to me of a certain fear and dissatisfaction. He would let remarks fall about things going too far, and would talk darkly about the need of saving his identity. At first, I ignored such references, but in time I began to question him guardedly, remembering what my friend's daughter had said about Asna's monotic influence over other girls at school. The cases where students had thought they were in her body looking across the room at themselves. This questioning seemed to make him at once alarmed and grateful, and he mumbled something about having a serious talk with me later. About this time, old Mr. Derby died, for which I was afterwards very thankful. Edward was badly upset, though by no means disorganized. He had seen astonishingly little of his parents since his marriage, for Asneth had concentrated in herself all his vital sense of family linkage. Some called him callous in his loss, especially since those jaunty and confident moods in the car began to increase. He now wished to move back into the old Derby mansion, but Asneth insisted on staying in the Crown and Shield house, to which she had become well adjusted. Not long afterwards, my wife heard of a curious thing from a friend, one of the few who had not dropped the Derbies. She had been out to the end of High Street to call on the couple, and had seen a car shoot briskly out of the driveway with Edward's oddly confident and almost sneering face above the wheel. Ringing the bell, she had been told by the repulsive wench that Asneth was also out, but had chanced to look up in the house's leaving. There, at one of Edward's library windows, she glimpsed the hastily withdrawn face, a face whose expression of pain, defeat, and wistful hopelessness was poignant beyond description. It was, incredibly enough in view of the usual domineering cast, Asneth's. Yet the caller had vowed that in that instant the sad, muddled eyes of poor Ed Edward were gazing out from it. Edward's quarrels now grew a trifle more frequent, and his hints occasionally became concrete. What he said was not to be believed, even in centuried and legend-haunted Arkham, but he threw out his dark lore with a sincerity and convincingness which made one fear for his sanity. He talked about terrible meetings in lonely places of cyclopean ruins in the heart of Maine woods beneath which vast staircases led down to abysses of knighted secrets, of complex angles that led through invisible walls to other regions of space and time, and of hideous exchanges of personality that permitted explorations in remote and forbidden places on other worlds and in different time-space continua. He would, now and then, back up certain crazy hints by exhibiting objects which utterly nonpulsed me. Elusively colored and baffling textured objects like nothing ever heard of on Earth. Those insane curves and surfaces no conceivable purpose and followed no conceivable geometry. These things, he said, came from outside, and his wife knew how to get them. Sometimes, but always in frightened and ambiguous whispers, he would suggest things about old Ephraim Waite, whom he had seen occasionally at the college library in the old days. Those adumbrations were never specific, but seemed to revolve around something especially hor some especially horrible doubt as to whether the old wizard were really dead, in a spiritual as well as a corporal sense. At times, Derby would halt abruptly in his revelations, and I wonder whether Asneth could have possibly divined his speech at a distance and cut him off through some unknown sort of telepathic mesmerism, some power of the kind she had displayed at school. Certainly, she had suspected he told me things, for, week, 
For as the weeks passed, she tried to stop his visits with words and glances of a most explicable potency. Only with difficulty could he get her get could he get to see me. For although he would pretend to be going somewhere else, some invisible force would generally clog his motions or make him forget his destination for the time being. His visits usually came when Asnath was away, away in her own body, he once oddly put it. She always found out later, the servants watched his goings and comings, but evidently she thought in it, it inexpedient to do anything drastic. Derby had been married more than three years on that August day when I got the telegram from Maine. I had not seen him from two months, but had heard he was away on business. Asnath was supposed to be with him. The watchful gossips declared there was someone upstairs in the house behind the double-curtained windows. They had watched the purchases made by the servants, and now the town marshal of Chesson Cook had wired of the draggled madman who stumbled out of the woods with delirious ravings and screamed for me for and screamed to me for protection. It was Edward, and he had been just able to recall his own name and my name and address. Chesson Cook is close to the wildest, deepest, and least explored forest belt in Maine and it took a whole day of feverishly jolting through fantastic and forbidding scenery to get there in a car. I found Derby in a cell at the town farm, vacillating between frenzy and apathy. He knew me at once and began pouring out meaningless, half-incoherent torrent of words in my direction. Dan, for the God's sake, the pit of Shagoths, down the six thousand steps, the abomination of abominations. I never would have let her take me, and then I found myself there. I Shibnagaroth. The shape rose from the altar, and there were five hundred that howled. The hooded thing bleated, Kamog, Kamog. That was old Ephraim's secret name in the coven. I was there, where she promised she wouldn't take me, a minute before I was locked in the library, and then I was there, where she had gone with my body, in the place of utter blasphemy, the unholy pit where the black realm begins, and the watcher's guards... The watcher guards the gate. I saw a Shagoth, and it changed shape. I can't stand it. I won't stand it. I'll kill her if she ever sends me there again. I'll kill that entity. Her, him, it. I'll kill it. I'll kill it with my own hands. It took me an hour to quiet him, but he subsided at last. The next day, I got him decent clothes in the village and set out with him for Arkham. His fury of hysteria was spent, and he was inclined to be silent though he began muttering darkly to himself when the car passed through Augusta, as if the sight of a city aroused unpleasant memories. It was clear that he did not wish to go home, and considering the fantastic delusions he seemed to have about his wife, delusions undoubtedly springing from the actual, some actual hypnotic ordeal to which he had been subjected, I thought it would be better if he did not. I would, I resolved, put him up myself for a time no matter what unpleasantness it would make with Asnath. Later, I would help him get a divorce, for most assuredly, there were mental factors which made this marriage suicidal for him. When we struck open country again, Derby's muttering faded away, and I let him nod and drowse on the seat beside me as I drove. During our sunset dash through Portland, the muttering commenced again, more distinctly than before, and as I listened, I caught a steady stream of utterly insane drivel about Asnath. The extent to which she had preyed on Edward's nerves was plain, for he had woven a whole set of, hallucin of hallucinations around her. His present predicament, he mumbled furtively, was one on was only one of a long series. She was getting a ho she was getting hold of him, and he knew that some day she would never let go. Even now, she probably let him go only when she had to, because she couldn't hold on for a long, hold on long at a time. She constantly took his body and went to nameless places for nameless rites, leaving him in her body and locking him upstairs. But sometimes she couldn't hold on, and he would find himself suddenly in his own body again, in some far-off, horrible, and perhaps unknown place. Sometimes she'd get a hold of him again, and sometimes she couldn't. Often he was left stranded somewhere as I had found him. Time and again, he had to find his way home from frightful distances, getting somebody to drive the car after he found it. The worst thing was that she was holding on to him longer and longer at a time. She wanted to be a man, to be fully human, 
That's why she got a hold of him. She had sensed the mixture of fine wrought brain and weak will in him. Some day she would crowd him out and disappear with his body. Disappear to become a great magician like her father and leave him marooned in that female shell that wasn't even quite human. Yet, he knew about the Innsmouth blood now. There had been trafficked with things from the sea. It was horrible. An old Ephraim. He had known the secret, and when he grew old, did a hideous thing to keep alive. He wanted to live forever. Asnath would succeed. One successful demonstration had already taken place. As Derby muttered on, I turned to look at him closely, verifying the impression of change which an earlier scrutiny had given me. Paradoxically, he seemed in better shape than usual, harder, more normally developed, without the trace of sickly flabbiness caused by his indolent habits. It was as if he had really a been really active and properly exercised for the first time in his coddled life. I judged that Asna's force must have pushed him into unwanted channels of motivation and alertness, but just now his mind was in a pitiable state, for he was mumbling extravagances about his wife, about black magic, about old Ephraim, and about some revelation which he would convince even me. He repeated names which I recognized from bygone brow browsings in forbidden volumes, and at times made me shudder with a certain thread of mythological consistency, of convincing coherence, which ran through his mutter mu uh, maundering. And again and again he would pause, as if to gather courage for some final and terrible disclosure. Dan, Dan, don't you remember him? The wild eyes and unkempt beard that never turned white. He glared at me once, and I never forgot it. Now she glares that way, and I know why. He found it in the Necronomicon, the formula. I don't dare tell you the plates yet, but when I do, you can read it and understand. Then you will know what has engulfed me, on, 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 body to body to body. He means to never die. The life glow, he knows how to break the link. It can flicker on a while, even when the body is dead. I'll give you hints, and maybe you'll guess. Listen, Dan, do you know why my wife always takes such pains with that silly backhanded writing? Have you ever seen a manuscript of old Ephraim's? Do you want to know why I shivered when I saw some hasty notes? Asnath had jotted down. Asnath, is there such a person? Why did they th half think there was poison in old Ephraim's stomach? Why do the Gilmans whisper about the way he shrieked, like a frightened child, when he went mad and Asnath locked him up in the padded attic room where the other had been? Was it old Ephraim's soul that was locked in? Who locked in whom? Why had he been looking for months for someone with a fine mind and a weak will? Why did he curse his daughters? Why did he curse that his daughter wasn't a son? Tell me, Daniel Upton, what devilish exchange was perpetrated in that house of horror where that blasphemous monster had his trusting, weak-willed, half-human child at his mercy? Didn't he make it permanent? As she'll do in the end with me? Tell me why that thing that calls itself Asnath writes differently when off guard, so that you can't tell its script from... Then the thing happened. Dervy's voice was rising to a thin treble scream as he raved, when suddenly it was shut off with an almost mechanical click. I thought of those other occasions at my home when his confidence had abruptly ceased, when I half fancied that some obscure telepathic wave of Asna's mental force was intervening to keep him silent. This, though, was something altogether different, and I felt infinitely more horrible. The face beside me was twisted almost unrecognizably for a moment. Well, through the whole body, th there passed a shivering motion. As if all the bones, organs, muscles, nerves, and glands were readjusting themselves to a radically different posture, set of stresses, and general personality. Just where the supreme horror lay, I could not for the life, for my life, tell. Yet, there swept over me such a swamping wave of sickness and repulsion, such a freezing, petrifying sense of utter alienage and abnormality, that my grasp of the wheel grew feeble and uncertain. 
the figure beside me seemed less like a lifelong friend than like some monstrous, monstrous intrusion from outer space, some damnable, un utterly accursed focus of unknown and malign cosmic forces. I had faltered only a moment, but before another moment was over, my companion had seized the wheel and forced me to change places with him. The dusk was now very thick, and the light of Portland far behind, so I could not see much of his face. The blaze of his eyes, though, was phenomenal, and I knew that he must now be in that queerly energized state, so unlike his usual self, which so many people had noticed. It seemed odd and incredible that is listless Edward Derby, who he could never assert him who he who could never assert himself and who had never learned to drive a car should be ordering me about and taking the wheel of my own car yet that was precisely what happened he did not speak for some time and in my inex inexplicable horror I was glad he did not the lights of Biddenford and Seiko I saw it, in the lights of Biddenford and Seiko I saw his firmly set mouth and shivered at the blaze of his eyes the people were right he did look damnably like his wife, and like old Ephraim when he was in these moods. I did not wonder that the moods were disliked. There was certainly something unnatural and diabolic in them. I felt the sinister element all the more because of the wild raving I had been hearing. This man, for all my lifelong knowledge of Edward Pickwin Derby, was a stranger, an intrusion of some sort from the Black Abyss. He did not speak until we were on a dark stretch of road, and when he did, his voice seemed utterly unfamiliar. It was deeper, firmer, and more decisive than I had ever known it to be. While its accent and pronunciation were altogether changed, though vaguely, remotely, and rather disturbingly recalling something I could not quite place, there was, I thought, a trace of very profound and very genuine irony in the timber. Not the flashy, meaningless, jaunty pseudo-irony of the callow, sophisticate which Derby had habit habitually affected, but some grim, basic, pervasive, and potentially evil. I marveled at the self-possession so soon following the spell of panic-struck and muttering. I hope you'll forget my attack back there, Upton, he was saying. You know what my nerves are, and I guess you can excuse such things. I'm enormously grateful, of course, for this lift home. You must forget, too, any crazy things I might have been saying about my wife, about things in general. That's what comes from overstudy in a field like mine. The philosophy is full of bizarre concepts, and when the mind gets worn out, it cooks up all sorts of imaginary concrete applications. I shall take the arrest for now, from now on. You probably won't see me for some time, and you needn't blame, blame Asnath for it. This qu trip was a bit queer, but it's really very simple. There are certain Indian relics in the North Woods, standing stones and all that, which mean a good deal in folklore, and Asnath and I are following that stuff up. It was a hard search, so I seem to have gone off my head. I must send somebody for the car when I get home. A month's relaxation will put me back on my feet. I did not recall just what my par own part of the conversation was, for the baff baffling alienage of my seatmate filled all my consciousness. With every moment, my feeling of elusive cosmic horror increased, till at length I was in a virtual delirium of longing for the end of the drive. Derby did not offer to relinquish the wheel, and I was glad of the speed for which Portsmouth and Newsbury Port flashed by. At the junction where the main highway runs inland and avoids Innsmouth, I was half afraid my driver would take the bleak shore road that goes through that damnable place. He did not, however, but darted rapidly past Rowley and Ipswich toward our destination. We reached Arkham before midnight and found the light still on at the old Crown Shield house. Derby left the car with a hasty repetition of his fate, thanks, and I drove home alone with a curious feeling of relief. It had been a terrible drive, all the more terrible because I could not quite tell why, and I did not regret Derby's forecast of a long absence from my company. Uh, let me see how much longer this is because I can feel my voice getting a little achy. Yeah. 
year. Yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and call it there for tonight. Because uh, I'm getting a little sore. And I do have a video to edit. <clears throat> Thank you everybody for sticking around, for showing up, for being here. I appreciate you all very much. Um, oh. Yeah, I forgot to bring my tea upstairs. I was going to go get it at, after I recorded that video. But then I didn't record the video. So. Um, Y'all have a great evening. Have some sweet dreams. Uh, I will see you tomorrow night. Those who are members on the channel. Tomorrow is our membership night. It is at... Uh, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. We're going to play some Among Us. Please stop by and join me. And join me. I would very much appreciate your company and getting to spend time with y'all. So, have a good night. And I'll catch up with you later. Stick around for the credits because these are all the wonderful people who have uh, seen fit to be members on my channel. Night, guys.